In Climate Watch, Canada is warming up twice as fast as the rest of the world. That's according to a report from the Canadian Environment and Climate Change Department. According to that report, since 1948, Canada's average land temperature rose by an estimated three degrees Fahrenheit. Now, this temperature rise has been accompanied by more rainfall in areas where snow has historically been more common. The findings come as the government imposed carbon taxes on four provinces after they failed to come up with plans to act on climate change. For more on all of this, we will bring in now CBS News contributing meteorologist Jeff Baradelli uh, to talk about what this means. Why are these temperatures rising so much? Is it us? Oh, for sure it's us because fossil fuels that we're burning, releasing carbon dioxide and, and, and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere are trapping like a blanket all of that heat. So there's no doubt about why it's happening. But specifically in places like Canada, uh, anywhere near the Arctic Circle, Alaska, Siberia, things are happening faster there. And the reason is because there's a loss of ice. So if you lose ice, you kind of lose that refrigerator effect, right? Um, and also ice tends to uh, basically reflect all the sunlight back into space. So when you lose ice, it's kind of like wearing a black shirt versus a white shirt. When you right. wear a white shirt, it's nice and cool. When you wear a black shirt, it absorbs all the heat. So if you lose all the ice around the Arctic Circle, what's happening is that light is not being reflected into space. It's being absorbed by the darker shades of water and land. And so things are happening much faster near the Arctic Circle. In Canada, it's, it's warming at the rate of at least two times. And in northern Canada, three times the rate of the rest of the globe. But what's frightening about that is it, it, would, it would seem exponential. So if there's less ice because of the warming, yes. that would kind of be a, um, a feedback loop. That's this exactly report, what it is, a positive feedback loop. Yeah. And, and this report projects the effects um, of this warming will intensify in the future. Like what, for example? Yeah, there's, there's no doubt about that. Temperatures will keep going up and they'll go up at the same rate they're going up right now in Canada and the same rate in the rest of the world. So what we end up seeing is Canada, especially northern Canada, uh, Alaska, especially northern Alaska, Siberia, those places will warm up a lot more uh, in the future. And not only does it reduce ice, because as you mentioned, that is a, a feedback loop, but it melts permafrost. And anybody who saw mm. Scott Pelley's report this weekend on 60 Minutes knows what that means. All sorts of things there, can be trapped in there, right? And there are, because it's all organic matter, and that releases a lot of carbon. In fact, estimates are that there's actually more carbon trapped in permafrost than there is in all the fossil fuel reserves in the world. So if that all were to melt, it would be a ticking time bomb, and that's what they call it a ticking time bomb. So this is what we're most concerned about when we talk about places like Canada, Alaska, and northern parts of Russia. And it's a big reason why all these climate scientists have been urging about this tipping point. Like if we get past this point yeah. of carbon in the atmosphere, yeah. it's tough to reverse it. Yeah. At this stage, is any of this reversible? Or if so, how long would it take? It's not reversible. You know, Canada talked about these carbon yeah. taxes, but... Well, you know, we, we need to take immediate action, <laughs> you know, really quick action. It's not reversible because carbon dioxide, once it's in the atmosphere, it's there unless we can suck it out. And, and something that we, we take into account is carbon capture and sequestration. Right. But the, the thing is, is that it, it barely works right now. It's not really technologically feasible on a big scale. So basically, the carbon dioxide that's there is there for, for at least several decades. And because of that, a certain amount of warming is baked in. So yes, the changes we're seeing in the Arctic, especially because we're losing ice, are irreversible in our lifetimes, the lifetimes of our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Now there's the chance 30, 40, 50 years, we might develop the technology and, and have it enough of it proliferated around the earth that we'll be able to suck that carbon dioxide out. But by then, we've already caused irreversible changes. Uh, depressing, as you really <laughs> let this all sink in, because you yeah. partner all that, uh, that you've said with what we know um, about this study, saying it, it causes, a, causes a drop in the survival rate for, for dolphins in Shark Bay. But it's not just dolphins. I mean, we're seeing this throughout the ecosystem. Ocean. What impact right. is this having on marine life? So ocean, oceans store about 93% of the excess heat that we are trapping due to greenhouse gases. Almost all that goes into the oceans. And because of that, the oceans are warming up. Because the oceans are warming up, we're seeing the ice melt around, uh, especially Antarctica and also towards the Arctic Circle. But we're also uh, causing these marine heat waves, which are killing coral. And we saw what happened a couple of years ago on the Australian Barrier Reef. We lost mm -hmm. at least 50% of it to a big bleaching incident, and they're happening a lot more often. 
In addition, uh, as water temperatures warm up, it holds less oxygen. So we end up with oxygen depleted zones and it's harder for these animals to breathe. And I'll add one more thing to the mix. So this big flooding situation that we had in the Midwest, that's gonna carry a lot of fertilizer down into the Northern Gulf of Mexico. So that as we head into summer and water temperatures warm up, probably even more because of climate change, it's going to cause huge algae blooms, and it's going to cause another big dead zone in the northern part of the Gulf of Mexico. It happens almost every year just outside of New Orleans. This one's going to be probably one of the biggest we've ever seen because of all this extra water and all this extra fertilizer that's being sent down the Mississippi River. So can we take what, what we found in this, this uh, climate change study in Canada and extrapolate that globally? Is this... I mean, it's, it's cliche to say canary in the coal mine because it's happening everywhere, but what does it tell us about the global, global health? That what you said, health. canary in the coal mine, is exactly right. Uh, this is a loud canary singing in a coal mine. And because it's not happening as much to us, where we're located in the mid latitudes of Europe and the United States, we're not seeing the effects as fast. But just look at our neighbors up north and see what's happening. Because what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. And that is really what could set off a chain of events that could cause that tipping point to happen where we lose a chunk of Greenland or we lose a chunk of Antarctica. Then all of a sudden our sea levels are not rising at a few millimeters a year or a few centimeters a year. They're rising at several inches, if not a couple of feet per decade. And then we have major problems because so many people, especially in developing countries, live along the coast and you know we have mass migrations. And that's why we're so concerned about climate change. It's not necessarily what's gonna to happen to you and me, although it will be hardship. It's hardship in these developing countries right. for the poor, the people right. that are more poor and people that will be displaced and that will cause conflict all over the world. Yeah. And that's what we're most concerned about. And that's why we have to tar uh, start taking action. And the UN has predicted as much. And in fact, yeah. it's part of a lot of nations defense postures saying that this is coming. But we still can make a change. We still can stop the worst effects of climate change. But we need to mobilize. We need to all come to agreement and just start moving forward. And by the way, by working together, it will bring us closer together. So there's actually a positive side to climate change that if we work together, it will bring us back together. We're so, you know, uh, separate now with our technology and everything. So there's actually a chance that this could help bring us together. I appreciate you yeah. ending this on an optimistic I'm trying. note. I'm trying. But this is a sobering, sobering report yes, indeed. Jeff Berardelli, thank you very You're much. Welcome.